I would love to ask you, please, to open your New Testaments to Luke's Gospel in chapter 1, please. Luke chapter 1. We'll get started with a short read there as we move up toward chapter 4. I'm glad that you're here today. Thankful for this. A couple of thoughts. It's no secret that this weekend is a national and international holiday, Christmas Eve today and Christmas Day tomorrow. In some ways, that's why we have visitors from out of town, and we're really glad that you're here. And whatever you think about that holiday, whether you celebrate it or not, or how you choose to do so, if you have a television or a radio or you've been out of your house, you know that during this time of year, there is extra attention in our world given to our Savior, Jesus Christ. There's extra focus on his birth and songs about that and t-shirts about that and conversations about that. And The truth of the scripture is we don't have any memorials established for us or for the New Testament church to particularly put emphasis on that as we do for his death. And that's why we had the Lord's Supper today. And I think everybody here understands that. It is also true that his birth was very important. It was a super, super big deal. And three of your gospels right off the bat, Matthew, Mark and Luke, want you to understand the value of that very important event and the kind of worship and adoration that he received. However, very early on after his birth, we find in scripture that the emphasis is not placed just on the fact that Jesus was born, but on why Jesus was born. It's not just about the fact that he came here. It's about understanding the purpose for which he came here. And I would tell you that if you want to use today, tomorrow, next week, every day of the week, to remember and celebrate the birth of Jesus, do that, but don't stop with the event. Make sure you understand the significance of that event and that that significance is as alive in you as your belief in the event itself. Now, I wanna show you how early this shows up really quickly in Luke chapter one. Jesus has been born or he is soon to be born. This is John who would come first and this prophecy about what John's mission would be being born just a few months before Jesus. And here's what is said about that. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. This is Luke 1 68. For he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. As he spoke by the mouth of his prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, serve him in holiness, serve him in righteousness before him all of our days. Now, this is before the birth of Jesus, and it's talking about how John would come and pave the way for Jesus. But Jesus coming wasn't just a miraculous virgin birth. It was redemption, verse 68. It was salvation, verse 69. It was mercy, verse 72. It was the granting of rescue, verse 74, so that we might serve him in holiness and fear. Your understanding of Christ's coming must incorporate all of those things that are intended by that coming. So as Jesus comes into the world and his birth is in the next chapter and he gets to the age of 30 and he starts his ministry, he goes around telling people that he came, but more importantly, he wants them to understand why he did so. So our text for today is just a couple of chapters later in Luke chapter four, please. Luke chapter four, when Jesus announces the favorable year of the Lord. That year was not the year he was born, though that was extremely valuable. It was the age that was ushered in by his coming. Now in Luke chapter four, I would like to begin reading the story in verse 14. We'll do a little bit of it. We'll head to Isaiah for a few minutes and then we'll come back and finish here. But pick up with me in Luke chapter four as Jesus is back in Nazareth. Verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up And as was his custom, this is Luke chapter four, verse 16. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, 
to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now we're going to get to read that prophecy today because it's a beautiful piece of poetry, Isaiah 61. But Jesus stands up and says, hand me this scroll. And he goes back 700 years and he reads the first two verses of a chapter that they would have known very, very well. And he says, this anointed one will come. This gospel will be preached. There'll be healing. There'll be deliverance. There'll be victory. All of these things. And the thing is, the Jews were waiting on that. They anticipated all of that. And I think they were glad that he read it. But then he follows up with this. He closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, we're not going to read it just yet. You may be tempted to do so. But do you know how they responded to that? They responded with, ooh, that sounds amazing, but you don't mean... You don't mean you, do you? Because that would be that would be incredible. That would be almost sacrilegious to claim that this great fulfillment is going to be through through you. Like we know your dad, he's a carpenter. And we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. But what Jesus is proclaiming to him is the full message of the virgin birth of the life and of the death that for centuries God had promised a favorable age, a year of jubilee. And Jesus said that is happening right now. So here's my question for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus came to set free the captives and to proclaim a favorable age for his people? And if you do believe it, and I know that you do, how deeply do you believe it? How emotional are you about it? How heavy of an impact is the age of the Messiah in the way that you live your life? I want it to be more than just Jesus came. I want it to be because of why Jesus came, my life has changed. So in, in order to do that, we're going to do something very simple today. We will come back to Luke 4 because I want to ask you how you kind of measure up to his locals and the way they responded to him. But what he does here in verses 18 and 19 is he takes them back to Isaiah 61 and he just introduces a chapter expecting them to think about the whole content of it. So that's what I'd like for us to do. You may want to hold your finger at Luke 4. We'll be back at the end. But I would love for you to open your Bibles back with me to Isaiah 61. Here's what I want to do. I just want to read it. It's 152 verses. It's 11 verses. 11. What I'm going to do is read it fairly slowly because I want to challenge you to do something while we're reading it. Now, you have a little bit of a, a little bit of a leg up on this because, you know, you should be thinking about Jesus when you read it. When he sat down there in Luke four, they had never connected that to Jesus. They connected that to some some warrior winning some battle over Rome, maybe a situation that they were just all lost all hope in. And he said, actually, I'm it. I'm, I'm the center of all that. You know that. So you, you have a little cheat sheet. But here's what I want to do. I'm going to read these 11 verses slowly. And all I want you to do is think about what is this about? What are these verses talking about? Even though you have the leg up of knowing that it's about Jesus, you still might get tripped up on a few of the verses. So we'll walk through them together. But I'm going to read it and I want you to think about it. And honestly, in case I forget to say this, I would love to issue a challenge for you and your family. Whenever you gather with your family tonight, today for lunch, or tomorrow morning, would you take five minutes with your family and just read Isaiah 61? Now, right now, you're like, I'm not going to read some Old Testament chapter, but give me about 20 minutes. And I think you'll be willing to do that. Follow along with me. And I have a few questions when we're done. Isaiah 61, verse one, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Verse four, then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. 
They will raise up the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers will stand and pasture their flocks and foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. But you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will have a double portion. Instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in their land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. Verse 8. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery in the burnt offerings, and I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Then their offspring will be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them will recognize them because they are the offspring whom the Lord has blessed. Verse 10. I, and this goes back to the writer, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts and as a garden causes the things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Is it anybody's first time to see Isaiah 61? It is beautiful. This ought to be the ode, the song that dominates every family here. And Jesus was waving his hands in the center, saying, this, I, I am this for you. So here's my question as we get started. I know I've telescoped this a little bit. When you read this, you were going through it with me. Who or what were you thinking about? Now you have three options, and maybe I'll capture everybody in the room by these three options. One is we have some, some Old Testament thinkers and historians in the room who are thinking of Isaiah 61 in its Old Testament context. If that's the way you read this, you, you thought, you know what? God needed to deliver the Israelites. The Israelites were in bondage. They were often in bondage. The Israelites were not free. The Israelites were mourning over their loss and they had everything taken from them. And verses four and five, their cities were, were ruined and all of this was decimated and God was gonna restore them again. This is the story of what God wanted for Israel. You'd be doing great. You'd be doing great because this was originally written for those people to represent those things. But even they would tell you that it never really came to pass. It would come to pass temporarily. They'd rebuild a few things. They'd get freed for a little while. And then before you know it, they were in bondage again. So even in the time of Jesus, that's why they're listening to him. When he read that scroll, they're going, boy, that has never actually really happened. Can you tell us more about that? But if you're the kind of person who thinks about it in its historical setting, that's great. But it means more because Jesus told us that it means more. Now, here's the second thing that might happen, and I'm not sure if I've pushed you too far in order to go there, but there are some difficult passages in Isaiah 61 when you start thinking about the church and the Christian age and today's date. So what we often do is we think about these verses in terms of the final judgment. Anybody in this room reading through Isaiah 61 think about, oh, one day that's all going to happen. One day when the Lord comes back, you talk about him coming the first time, that's impressive. He's going to come super impressively the second time and everything is going to ultimately come to pass. If you read Isaiah 61 that way, then I see why you did that. I just think that maybe you, you skipped too far ahead. Here's why we might do that. Like verse two, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who afflict it, who mourn. Now you might go day of vengeance. That's the last day. The day of vengeance is when Jesus comes back and retribution is dealt out. It's like at Thessalonians 1. And that will be a day of vengeance. But this text is not about that day. It's about what happened on Pentecost. It's about rendering God's judgment against sin, against Satan. It was a day of great vengeance of God when he removed the sting of the devil. But we want to think about like the final day of vengeance. It's okay if you do that. I'm not here to tell you you're wrong about that. I'm just here to say you might be missing some immediate richness if you do that. Uh, another example might be um, verse 10. 
uh, verse 10, like I rejoice greatly in the Lord. He's clothed me with garments of salvation. He's wrapped me with the robe of righteousness. And you might be like, oh, that's going to be amazing one day. One day, like Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, I'm naked now and I'm going to be clothed. Or the book of Revelation, he's going to put a crown and a robe on us. One day I'm going to be clothed in righteousness, verse 10, and I'm going to receive this garment of salvation. Yeah, one day you, you will, but I got news for you. I'm already wearing mine. Like Jesus didn't come and say, listen up, everybody. It's like 30 AD, 30 AD. Listen up, everybody. The day of the fulfillment of this has already come in 2027. 2000 years from now. I just made that up. I have no idea when Jesus is coming back. It's total mega. The day of the Lord has come, but not for 3000 years. That's not what he was saying. He's saying this day is here. Like everything that this text was going to bring about, you are about to receive through me. Through my birth, sure, but more importantly, through my ministry and teaching and life and death and resurrection and ascension. So what we need to do in this text more than that is we need to think about it in terms of what it means for us now. So this will not take long to do. I'll reference some New Testament verses along the way, but I just want you to think about the beauty of this in your family. And I'm going to tell you again, I, I think every family here, you guys at the village, different groups, like just sit down at some point today with your family or tomorrow and just read this. And I'm going to have these little handouts in the back so you can at least have some ideas for what it means. Let's start in verse one. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And of course, you naturally are drawn to Jesus who had the Holy Spirit descend upon him in the early part of his ministry when he was baptized because the Lord has anointed me. What did he anoint Jesus to do? To bring good news to the afflicted, verse one, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to the prisoners. The first thing I want you thinking about is that what Jesus' mission was, was to provide healing to the sick and lame and hurting and to provide freedom to the captives. And you see that here in this text. And you might be like, yeah, there were people who had leprosy and he made them better. And there were people who maybe were slaves and they got set free because of the gospel. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the sickness that only he can free you from. He's talking about the sickness of sin, the bondage. You see how they go together? The sickness and the bondage of what the devil has been doing in your life, what the devil has been working through your choices, that idea where all you're really able to feel is affliction because of your sin. Your heart can only be broken because you know that you break the heart of God with your sin. You cannot feel free or safe for your own life defies the possibility of it. And Jesus came to say, I will give you liberty. Liberty from what? Liberty from sin's bondage, liberty from the bondage of the old law that only kept its thumb on us when we sinned. I live under the law, James 1, of liberty, the law of Christ that frees me, that fills my life with grace. We have been healed from our afflictions of sin and we have been freed from the capture of the devil. And Jesus is the one who did that for us. Verses two and three. He said, look, I've come to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now, verse three, listen, to grant those who mourn in Zion, those who are mourning and crying and suffering. I'm going to put a garland around their neck instead of the ashes that they wear. I'm going to fill up their vessel with the oil of gladness instead of the desperation of emptiness in mourning. Their mantle will be that of praise instead of some weight around their neck that causes them to faint. They will not be weak. They will not be broken. They will be oaks. Love this phrase. Almost titled the whole thing this. You will be called oaks of righteousness. You ever seen an oak tree? Strong and firm. Because we will be planted by the Lord that he may be glorified. And so it's not just this idea that he says, you're sick and I will heal you or you're captive and I will set you free. Though that is a great way to theme this chapter. He goes on to say, I'm coming to bring comforts into your life where nothing else can provide it. And maybe you know that by now in your life. That we mourn sickness and sorrow and death 
and guilt and shame and humiliation and the state of things. And there's nothing in the world that you can do to recover from that kind of mourning. Jesus said, I'll do it. I will bring you comforts. And I, I use the, the plural here because I was thinking about um, even the great afflictions of 2 Corinthians 1. We read 2 Corinthians recently. He is the God of all what? The God of all comforts. The text says in affliction, in any affliction, in all affliction, there is no persecution, there is no sorrow, there is no diagnosis, there is nothing that he cannot come in and provide some sense of peace and comfort. Only Jesus. You think anything in this world can provide that? Only Jesus can provide that. Now, he calls it the favorable year of the Lord. I'll just toss this in as an extra. I did a sermon here a few years ago called the year of Jubilee. You guys know about the year of Jubilee? So for 49 years in Israel, you bought and you traded and you sold. And sometimes you got sold into slavery and sometimes you had uh, crushing debt, you know. And for 49 years, you just kind of managed it. But on the 50th year, everybody just got to get everything back. You got your land back, you got your, your life back, your family back, everything was released. And everybody there had to kind of be willing to do that, which I imagine was kind of tough. That, you know, on the 50th year, if somebody was indebted to you, you just let them go free, that favorable year. But Jesus said, how about if it wasn't a year? What if it was an age, like an entire kingdom forevermore? And that's what he came to do. He came to give us comfort, and so there would not be ashes, mourning, and fainting. And then he came to make us strong. It's not just about making you not sorrowful. It is about establishing your roots. It makes me think of, of Psalm 1. Your roots will be planted firmly by the springs of water and you will bear your fruit in your season and your leaf will not wither. And in whatever you do, you will prosper. Is that because of your strength? Don't be a fool. Before Jesus and without Jesus, you will never have a strength like that. You will never be able to stand. Jesus came to say, I'm going to heal you, free you, give you hope and peace. Even when people you love die, you can have hope and peace. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to provide you strength. I wish I had more time to dig in on these. But there are two strengths the New Testament talk a lot about. One of them is the strength of Jesus himself. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He has made me an oak tree of righteousness. And also Ephesians 3 verse 16, through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gift that provides that strength, Ephesians 3 and verse 16. Go back to our text. In verses 4 and 5, he says this, Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers will stand and pasture your flocks, and foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. Where's he going with all of that? Well, this is, for me, when I was reading it the first couple of times, this is where my mind went back to Israel. You know what would happen when they would get in trouble, when they chose not to serve God, and they didn't want to be an oak of righteousness, and he would uproot them. You don't want to be an oak of righteousness? Then I want to make you, then I'll uproot you. And they got taken away, and their cities would get destroyed, and their land would be taken, and they'd be foreigners. And then when they would turn to him by faith and say, please, we need you to heal us, then he would reestablish them. But I still think that this entire chapter Jesus is introducing to us is an age in which we live now. And I want to be clear, as I said in the introduction, I'm not convinced verse 4 is just talking about Israel after Babylonian captivity. I don't think you would think that either. But I'm also not convinced that verse 4 is about when we get to heaven. When we get to heaven, we're going to be in a beautiful temple. When we get to heaven, we're going to be surrounded by beautiful provisions. Yeah, you will, but you're already there. We are a part of the family of God. We are the temple of God. Restoration and rebuilding has already happened. This sense of restoring that which was torn down by sin, that which was torn down by worldliness will be rebuilt. Those ancient ruins. It makes me think about our life when we're young, when we have no sin, when we're with God. And then we go out and we do our own thing and everything starts to crumble around us as it has to without God. And then we come back to him and he says, I can work with that. And he uses us like bricks in the wall and he rebuilds everything. I will raise up those devastations and I will repair them. This is the kingdom imagery of the New Testament. Why does it call us a kingdom? Why does it call us a temple? Why does it call us a building? Because that which was torn down, what did Jesus say about the temple? You guys remember? I'll tear it down. What did he say? Three days later, I'll build it back again. 
what in the world's he talking about? Well, that's what their problem was. They didn't know what he was talking about. Okay, first of all, he's going to tear down this thing. And third, second of all, how's he going to rebuild it? But he said, look, this physical idea is going to come down. I'm going to build a new spiritual kingdom, a restored, renewed, righteous structure. And I'm going to be talking about this a lot next year. So I'll just toss a little bit in here and there. It is a major mistake in Christianity to think too individualistically about your salvation. You read verse four and you're like, God restored me. God restored my life. I am a rebuilt structure. Strike one, strike two, strike three. You've missed the whole point. The point is he has reconstructed a city, a kingdom, a people, plural. You're just one of them. We're being restored into a city where I'm not restored just to him. I'm restored together with you. And we've got to get clearer on that. He would say a little later, the, you say, what's the, what's the diversity thing? Well, verse six is interesting. There's a couple ways of, or verse five of looking at it. Uh, some read it more like these guys became servants of theirs. I think there's room to talk about that. But I was reading some interesting stuff about these strangers who, who had to be apart from the kingdom now will be a part of it. They'll be standing with you. They'll be pasturing your flocks. These foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. And when you think about the gospel that Jesus brought in, he's even quoting Old Testament passages that says, look, we're going to offer salvation to the Jews and the Gentiles. We're going to offer it to the strangers. We're going to offer it to the foreigners. It's not just for a select number of people. It's for anyone, anywhere. People who never had access before are now invited openly in. You say, well, I don't know what I think about that. Well, you better be glad about that because guess what you are? Guess what you are? A foreigner. A stranger. A Gentile. In years past, if you've been born in another age, the only way God's people could be holy is if they got rid of you. And Jesus came and said, flipping that, gates are wide open. I'm inviting anybody in who wants to be healed and free and comforted and rooted and be a part of a restoration, not just be restored individually, be part of a restoration. Keep moving. Verses six and seven. You will be called the priests of the Lord. And that's got to remind you of 1 Peter 2, where we're all priests of the Lord. This is part of how you know this is leading forward. Because under the law of Moses, only a certain sect of them, a certain piece of them were priests of the Lord. 1 Peter 2 says we're all priests of the Lord. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations and their riches. You will boast. Instead of shame, you're going to have a double portion. Instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over your portion. They will possess a double portion in the land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. And so comes both assignments and blessings. Now, I word it that way on purpose. I've thought a little while on what words to choose here. But I think most of us are really interested in the second thing. Uh, double portion, count me in. You know who you are tomorrow. You know exactly who you are. The double plate portion person. Double portion? More than ever? Absolutely. Absolutely. We got a brisket from uh, James the other day. We got some family coming over. I think we're going to hide it until it's just me and it. Triple portion, quadruple portion. This idea that he says, look, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to, you know, you were, you were destitute. You didn't fit. You had nothing. I'm going to give you a double portion. Now, this is challenging because it makes us go to heaven because you think that doesn't happen on this earth. Christians don't get a double portion here. We don't rule over the nations. They don't serve under us. That's a heaven thing. It'll be realized in heaven. But you know, a lot of this, a lot of this chapter relates to uh, Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes. What did it say about the meek? For the meek will eventually get to heaven and things will be okay. No. The meek will what? Inherit the earth. I got to tell you, you can fight me on this if you want. I mean, you, you can fight me for yourself if you want, but I think I'm the most blessed person on, in the world. I think, no, not you, me. <laughs> I'm not living through on this earth going, oh, this is so hard and so bad and we're just so... Now, granted, we live in a very free and wonderful, prosperous time, so it's, it's easier for us to do. Although an attitude of joy even existed by Paul while he lived in prison because he knew who he was. And he knew who Christ was. And he knew why he was alive. 
And he knew what he was doing with his life. And he knew what God was doing with his life. And he knew why God was doing it. His life was filled with purpose. I feel filled with purpose. And I feel like I am living with a double portion. And it has nothing to do with money. We were in San Francisco the other day and we went down Billionaire's Row. Okay, that's real money. They had just asked the guy if it ever snowed in San Francisco. He said, it almost never snows in San Francisco. We go by a billionaire's house. There's snow everywhere. He bust in snow. Like, okay, that's rich. That's cool. If that guy's not a Christian, I don't just have a double portion. I have an infinite portion greater. Even here, you go, you mean when you get to heaven? No. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But I mean right now. The full blessing. Because I also understand that God made this earth and he made it for us and he's given provisions for us and the rain and the sunshine and all the things is all God's blessing. And I experience a double portion even here in the flesh of the natural world. And of course, there are blessings. But did you know, as I said, everybody wants a double portion, but are you also interested in the assignments? Assignment, I don't like that word, assignments. Well, I chose it, it's not in the text. You can rewrite it if you want. But he said, look, I'm gonna bless you unbelievably now and later, but you are going to be my priests. And you are going to be my ministers. You are going to be the ones who carry out my work. You're going to be the ones who officiate among my people. You are going to be the ones who share the gospel. Priests serving fellow Christians, ministers sharing the gospel with the world. Are you interested in both? Because it's a little bit of what we call a package deal. Look at the last two verses of this section, verses eight and nine. For I, the Lord, I love justice. I hate robbery and the burnt offerings, and I will, I will faithfully give them their recompense. And you might be talking about those who were unfaithful, but I think he may be turning to those who are faithful because he says, I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Then their offspring will be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples and all who see them will recognize them because they are the offspring whom the Lord is blessed. And so lastly here in this section, God has chosen to make a covenant with us. He has entered into an agreement with us. It is not temporary. It is not fickle. It is not subject to change. His covenant is eternal. Is it conditional? Yes, it's conditional upon our willingness to pursue him and appreciate all of this and our willingness to just sign up to be priests and ministers. Nobody who says, I don't want to be a priest. I'm not interested in the church stuff. And I don't want to be a minister. I'm not interested in the gospel stuff. Well, you can't be a part of this. I mean, it's pretty clear in the text. But those who are, he says, I'll enter into a covenant with you that not even death can sever. Are you interested in that? A covenant of protection that death cannot even sever. And I love this last part, verse 9. We are recognized, as it was in Tim's prayer and some, some songs, we are recognized as children of God. He's our Father. We get to call Him Father. And so when I put recognition, I could just make the point that we are recognized by the Father as His adopted children, which is awesome. But it's not the point of verse 9. Point of verse nine is that even people in the world will recognize you. Are you scared about that? You trying to hide that? Are you ashamed of that? You want people to know that? Because what became by nature of all of this happening is you will be known among the nations. They'll say, that's a Christian. That's a part of the church. That's someone who's found their hope in Christ. That is someone who has become a child of God. I'm optimistic about 2024 and the lives we get to live and the work of this church if we are priests and ministers and we want the world to know it. I want the world to know that Jesus ushered in the most favorable year and life that I could ever have. And I think it's awesome that we're known for that. You go, oh, this culture's really changing. Yeah, yeah, everybody said that every generation. The world's a bad place. It's bad in Romans 1, still bad. But the more worldly it gets, the more his people stand out. People who are not captive by those things, not humiliated by the fear that accompanies them and the destruction of it. People who've signed up to be priests and ministers and live with a double portion. Boy, the world, is the world not finding out that there's not a double portion out there? The world's finding that out. I saw a quote from uh, Jim Carrey the other day. You got, everybody knows Jim Carrey, you know, the actor. And, and he said a few years ago, he said, I, I hope that everybody in the world gets everything they ever wanted, all the fame and fortune they ever thought that they needed so they can realize that none of it matters. That's nice, but depressing. Unless you learn that it's not just about nothing else mattering, it's about Jesus mattering. And that which he provides. So let's finish with this. Verses 10 and 11. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. 
I will greatly rejoice in the Lord for all of what we have read here and for these final two thoughts. Verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God. Why? I'll tell you why. For he, he has clothed me. He will clothe me in heaven, but I'm clothed now. I've been clothed with the garment of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. Now, you guys know I've taught on righteousness this year. It's a tough topic because righteousness innately exists in God and it is part of the gift that comes from God, his righteousness and gifted through Christ for those who love him and seek him. I've been wrapped in the robe of righteousness. However you want to see it, he sees me as such. He said, you're like the bridegroom and the bride. You've decked yourself with a garland when you have entered into a relationship with him and you're like a bride who adorns herself with jewels. So I'm going to praise him because I've been clothed in two amazing things. I am saved and I am righteous. Though I am not righteous, I am righteous. Praise be to God for his limitless grace. What does that mean? Verse 11. It's kind of like what we said in verse 6. There's roles associated with this. There's more than just opening your hands and going, oh, it's so awesome. I'll take all of it you want to give. He said, yeah, but understand some things here. You're an oak, but oaks produce things. For as the earth, verse 11, brings forth its sprouts, as a garden causes the things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. It's not just the nations looking at the church and looking at your family and looking at you and saying, look what they have received. It is also look at what they are producing. Do you get it? It's not just look at what they have received. What you've received is, is rooting by God. But what it produces is righteousness, faithfulness, and praise. If you're one of those people going, give me all the righteousness, but it's not producing righteousness, then the relationship doesn't exist. It's, it's just in your mind. It will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. I think more collectively when I think about that, that his church should be producing that. But ultimately, it's just a bunch of individuals trying to do so in their own life contributing to the whole. Verse 9, verse 11 draws us to a conviction that this is supposed to mean something. It's all the imagery of the New Testament. Jesus did it a dozen times. He told stories and he used plants to do it. I will plant it. I will fertilize it. I will prune it, but I want fruit from it. Are you okay with that? As this year ends, we get to the end of 2023. Are you okay with that? Read this with your family. Go, let's read Isaiah 61. Let's celebrate the favorable year of the Lord. Let's talk about all that we are. But let's also take a quick peek at verse 6 and verse 11. Just a quick peek. Let's make sure we understand why he's done all of this through us and what he should receive. Let's finish in Luke 4. Luke 4. I hope that this has great meaning in your heart and life. And I hope it shapes everything that you do. All of the choices that you make. I mean, if you're a tree firmly planted by God and you're drawing his nutrients and you're going to produce his fruit to the best of your ability. And he's patient. And he prunes it and he's careful with it. And if you don't produce right, he'll fertilize and help you get there. But that has to be the objective. But here's what really drew me into the lesson. I was just reading this this week. And I read the section in Luke 4. We'll finish in Luke 4. Where he read that. And of course, he was talking about him. He said in verse 21, today the scripture has been fulfilled. And the, the response is really interesting. Pick up verse 22. And all were speaking well of him. In other words, they love that. They love that he read Isaiah 61. They're excited about it too. And wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do it here. Do your miracles in your hometown as well. He said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over the land, and yet Elijah wasn't sent to any of them. Not the Israelite widows, none of them, but only to Zarephath, uh, Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet none of them got healed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogues, they understood what was being said here and they were very upset about it. All the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and they drove him out of the city and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing by their midst, he went his way. Boy, that, uh, that descended quickly. From him sitting, standing in the synagogue reading, going, look at this, and them going, that is amazing. And then a few minutes later, they're trying to throw him off a cliff. Why? How many of you are familiar with the phrase, familiarity breeds what? Content. 
familiar. Let me tell you how it worked here. They were familiar with Jesus. They'd grown up with him. They'd seen him grow up. They knew his brothers. They knew his mom and his dad. He was just Jesus to them. And he's coming and going, I'm not just Jesus. I'm the fulfillment of every promise you've ever yearned for. But they were so familiar with him that they, they didn't see him that grandly. I mean, we see this in our world. You got somebody very close to you and others see them as very grand and influential. And to you, you're like, eh, you know, familiarity. So familiarity breeds like, I can't come up with a word right now, but like, meh, that's what it breeds. Meh. And Jesus comes in and says, there's nothing meh about me. I'm everything to you, and you're blind for not seeing it. And it's like when all those Israelite lepers had their noses fall off, fell off, and one foreign guy who got the message was saved. When all those widows starved in their faithlessness, who should have, who were right there with God, and the foreign widow was the one who was saved, and they got mad. And so familiarity bred meh. And when they were told there's no room for this, they got angry. Here's my final exhortation to you. I know you believe everything you've seen here. My question is, is it meh? You've been raised in the church. It's like you were raised with Jesus. It's like you've always been around him. He's always been around you and you've always been around church people. And it's almost like you're going, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is great, but I want him to do something now. If he's really Jesus, he's really awesome and it's really worth it. I was raised in the church. I'm kind of, eh, I don't know. Jesus, do something now. And that's what he told them. He said, that's what you're saying. You're going, monkey, clip, clap your symbols. Work for me some miracles. Show me a reason. He's like, I've shown you everything you ever need to see. And you're asking for more. Does it make you angry? You can't run Jesus off a cliff and there's no cliffs nearby. So I'm feeling pretty good. But it may make you angry to hear this. But if all this has become very commonplace to you, you probably won't even read Isaiah 61 in the morning. Why? It's Christmas Day. It's about gifts. You're not going to read the Bible. Everybody knows about Jesus already. Everybody knows church is important. If your idea is, you know, just familiarity breeding passiveness, then you need to wake up. You need to see him again. You need to hear him again. You need to study Isaiah 61. It needs to become the theme of your home. And if you're going, Chris, are you saying that there's a chance I might miss out on all the blessings in the world unless I wake up and see him for who he is? That's exactly what Jesus was saying. And that's why they tried to throw him off a cliff. And he, you know what he did? He walked past them and he went and found somebody who wanted to hear it. I do not want him walking past. I was raised among him and his people. I don't want him walking past me saying, well, you're never going to get honor with people who are raised in the church. <laughs> not going to get honor there. Doesn't mean anything to them anymore. I was raised in the church. I don't want him walking past me to go find some widow somewhere else or someone with leprosy somewhere else. I want him to heal and protect me. Make him real to you and to your family because the favorable year of the Lord is here. If we can help you be a part of it, you can obey him. You can be baptized into his name. He told you to. You can honor him and serve him. He's worth it. He's always worth it. You can come now as together we stand and sing.